Hello, loud teachers, and welcome to Learning Is Not Quiet presents Author's Purpose. Today, I'm going to talk about the ways that I teach Author's Purpose in my classroom, specifically using the products found in my Teachers Pay Teachers store. I am going to talk about some of the strengths of those products, as well as some pitfalls to avoid. I am also going to talk about ways to differentiate those products and extend them to meet the needs of all of your students. If you're watching this video, it's probably because you purchased or are interested in purchasing this Author's Purpose notebook and game and uh, presentation, this distance learning activity, or this game. Please note that this Author's Purpose Keep Talking game is found in this package, so don't double buy. If you see any products you like in this presentation, please note that links are in the description. Um, also, if you have any questions about purchasing or about how to use something, I'm always happy to help teachers. Please just message me and reach out on Teachers Pay Teachers. Remember to search for Learning Is Not Quiet. All right, so without further ado, let's begin. I'm going to start with this Author's Purpose Keep Talking game. And this is probably a more simple card game that I have for reading uh, in my store. Some of the other ones are a little bit more complicated, a little bit uh, more challenging for students. This one is kind of basic. So what you want to do is when you open up this product, you're going to see two sets of cards, these green topic cards and these purpose yellow cards. Um, my pro tip for cutting out cards is take these sheets, laminate them, and bring them to a local high school or middle school. Find someone who needs service hours, especially someone who's like very busy and a sports team. Um, it's win-win. They get to do their service hours in front of the TV on their own time, and you get help and don't have to spend all of your life on cutting out cards and on teaching. So that's my pro tip. It really makes your life so much easier and I've had really great success with that. So once you have your cards cut out, you should have two decks, one of these green cards and one of these yellow cards. So the first way that you can use this is you can pull a green card, pull a yellow card, and as an assessment, as a class activity, as a brainstorm, you can say, all right, everybody, I want you to write a story about entertaining pizza, okay? And so the kids will have to write with this author's purpose and this topic. So how the actual game works is, again, you have these two decks of cards, yellow and green, and students will pick up one from each. It's very important that they reshuffle the yellow cards every time or that you print out more than one copy. Otherwise, it'll be very, very, very obvious based on which ones you haven't already used. So I have my cards and I'm not gonna show them to anybody else, right? I'm keeping them to myself and I am the storyteller. With younger students, students who um, may have disabilities, you wanna use a shorter amount of time, like 30 seconds to a minute. For older students and for more of a challenge, you can go one to three minutes. Um, and obviously, depending on the time and resources that you have. So my goal as the storyteller is to tell a story for the designated amount of time that has this author's purpose of this topic. So mine is to persuade about pizza. And I'm going to say, Napoleon pizza is the best kind of pizza in the world. It is found in southern Italy and involves putting things into an oven that's over 500 degrees. It is the best kind of pizza and so much better than the pizza that we have here in America that's just a giant fast food grease bomb. Okay, so... Then everybody else in my group, when the time is up, has to try to guess what the topic was and what the author's purpose was. I would say uh, probably about 90% of the time the students guess accurately because, like I said, this is not one of the more challenging games that I have. But it is really powerful in that it gets students to really start thinking about and recognizing the author's purpose when they're reading and when someone else is talking without having to dive right into a text. Um, the other thing that it's really good for is it gets students in the habit of using that language of author's purpose, persuade, inform, and entertain. And it also is really good at developing students' creativity about topics, and it helps with their public speaking, which I know is a big standard all across the United States. So, um, okay, so ways that you can use this game are as a cumulative activity. You can use it during standardized testing time when you want kids to be engaged and keep learning, but without, you know, heavy worksheets or heavy brain power. Um, it's also a great I'm finished activity. Put it in a baggie, put it in the back of the classroom. Kids, when they're done, can grab it and play it quietly at their desks or in the hallway because I always have really, really large classes. Um, okay, so with that, let's move on from this game. And now I'm going to talk about this distance learning activity and this author's purpose notebook.
The key difference between these two, like I said earlier, the Author's Purpose Notebook includes the game. It also includes a PowerPoint, and it's really meant to be done in person. So as you're doing these activities, there will be PowerPoint slides that you project to the class, and they also have a lot of the answers on those slides that students can follow along with in their notebooks. For this distance learning one, it's intended to be done in a socially distanced classroom or over Zoom. And instead of projecting things, instead the slides or the pictures or whatever are right there on the Google Forms and it grades the answers for you. I just skipped some of the activities on the distance learning one because they're just not possible in a distance learning setting, but you can use the ideas from this and adjust as you see needed. Okay, so with that, this is the first activity. Now, when you open up this product, you might look at the first activity and go, that's not as rigorous as I thought this was going to be, and that's by design. My reading strategies are intended to be done over five days. Um, and I know, you know, assemblies happen, life happens, we have four-day work weeks, half days, whatever. So just as you see needed, but that's kind of the ideal setting is this would take place over five days. Um, and it's scaffolded. So as you go through each day, it gets a little bit harder. The first day is really about introducing that topic and not really connecting it to reading or writing to build up that understanding in your mind. I like to think of reading strategies as drawers in our brain. And I don't like to fill it with just one kind of learning, right? If we just do worksheets, if we just do multiple choice, that's only one thing in the drawer. And I wanna fill that drawer with all kinds of experiences, happy memories, rigorous things, challenges, so that students, when they need to access author's purpose, they have all kinds of things to build from. And it's also easier for them to remember longer term if they have these kinds of memories associated with it. So that's day one. Day two is all about kind of directly teaching the topic, introducing a strategy, and having students apply and work with that strategy. Days three and four are all about kind of introducing the rigor. Now we're applying it to texts. Now we are uh, interacting with that material in a more rigorous way. And day five is a Broadway musical assessment slash challenge, depending on how you want to use it. So for this first day, we have this author's purpose activity. And it says, take a look at each of the signs shown in the presentation. What do you think the author is trying to convey? And what do you think the purpose of that sign is? So students will take a look at that sign and they're gonna identify what they think the author's purpose is. And I think this is great to do before you introduce the idea of persuade, inform, and entertain, because in the discussion after this, you get a really good sense of what students already know and what they don't know. And that's very powerful. Also, you can kind of brainstorm what words people use to uh, describe author's purpose. and what I like to do, especially if I feel like my class is kind of getting it already, is take those words and start to apply them to what entertain means or inform. So someone might say funny and I'd be like, okay, where do you think funny fits in persuade, inform, and entertain? It's entertain, right? So that's kind of helpful again to attach that language and also to add more things to that reading strategy drawer. Okay, this is what that looks like in real life. Ideally, the student would have written in complete sentences. Um, so you have to prioritize what is really important with this lesson. For me, it was not about complete sentences. It was just kind of seeing what they already know. Okay, so day two, we actually introduced the idea of pie or persuade, inform, and entertain. There are slides in both the distance learning and the projected version that kind of teach that directly to students, and then they need to apply it by sorting these definitions and examples with the purpose. Me, my big pet peeve on interactive notebooks is I do not like the ones that are super foldy and crazy and involve all kinds of glitter glue and stuff. Um, for me, I do not like interactive notebooks that take more than five to 10 minutes. Um, you should be done with this very, very quickly. Um, I still like interactive notebooks because they give students a chance to manipulate and move around ideas without um, having to do another worksheet. Especially if you have students with pretty severe disabilities, what you can do, and if you're really interested in investing in this long term, you can laminate the base sheet laminate the second sheet, cut it out, and add magnets to the back and have them sort it each day as like a file folder game. For most of my students, I have them do this in their language arts or reading notebooks. So that's that. They get it directly. They interact with the material. They sort it. That's day two. So for days three and four, for this one, I'm going to show you kind of the overview. We have a library hunt, a magazine and newspaper hunt, read it practice, and beyond pie. 
Sometimes I assign this magazine or newspaper hunt as homework or a project at home uh, because I don't like having the mess in my classroom. Sometimes I'm really brave and I go and I find like magazines from Costco and grocery stores that they're going to throw out anyway. Um, and that's how I get them in my classroom. I also sometimes mix it up where I do like the library hunt and then the read it practice afterwards and the magazine hunt the next day on day four and the beyond pie after that. So with the library hunt in your classroom, school or local library, find at least five books and write the title and the author for each for each category of author's purpose. So what you're going to do, for example, they go find Harry Potter and they open up Harry Potter, for example. I mean, you're hoping that they expand and look at books that they haven't really seen. This is also a great intro to the library if you're at the beginning of the school year and your librarian wants to give a tour. This is really great to see if they're able to find nonfiction books and fiction books. Um, so I go to the library, I have students open it, say they find Harry Potter. What they do is they would write Harry Potter and the Sorcerer's Stone, JK Rowling, and they would write that in the entertain column. So it's book one, Harry Potter, right? Entertain. So that's how that one works. Number two is this magazine or newspaper hunt. So what they're doing here is they're cutting out pictures or headlines from articles that fit each of these categories um, that the authors write. So it's kind of like a collage in the end, um, especially for students with disabilities. A way to differentiate this is to have them find pictures or uh, things like that, because pictures can actually also be about persuading, informing, and entertaining, especially in magazines where there's all kinds of advertisements. Okay. Next, we have the read it practice. For this, they're reading short stories and they're addressing whether it's persuade, inform, or entertain. I have a lot of stories about pie, again, to really emphasize pie, 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 persuade, inform, entertain. The next reading exercise is beyond pie, um, and it kind of gets into this fact versus opinion, which is very important in this day and age. Um, and I really take that time to emphasize this here. Okay, so that's days one through four. Um, you can always assign this for homework, but I really like those reading activities to be independent work or at a most with, a, with one partner. If you do it as a group, it just becomes totally messy and you really don't get a sense of what students are learning or what they're taking away for themselves. So day five is the Broadway musical one. For the rest of the week, I take things as participation, like as for completion grade. On day five with the Broadway musical, I actually take this for a grade. Um, how I came up with Broadway Musical Mania, and I have a whole video on this as well, is that I went through years and years and years of really standardized tests from Virginia, from Colorado, from all over the United States, and I looked for common themes of sentence stems, and then I used those sentence stems in my questions about these Broadway musicals. Why I think it's really powerful is that students don't really have to read it themselves. They get to interact with a really challenging text that is really advanced language, but they get to listen to it out loud in a song while following along on their sheet. I've seen a lot of success with Broadway Musical Mania, and it's a very popular product in my store. So what I do first is I have students sit at their desks. This one is Extraordinary from Pippin, and I have them read it quietly to themselves. And for this one, because we're focusing on author's purpose, I might ask them what, what they think the author's purpose is of this song. The second time I actually play the song, no video, because that gives a lot more away. Um, and I have them usually take a highlighter, find really good examples of word choice. Version three, and I'll show you this with a student example, I have them start visualizing and start drawing quick little sketches of what they see or what they think this is about. You'll see an avid strategy where I actually have my students um, number the stanzas. That's another thing we do when, uh, on the first round through. So you want to listen to this song a couple of times. Another trick is for students who have attention problems or ADHD, have them take the eraser of their pencil and literally follow along word by word. And that way you can quickly see whether or not they're paying attention. And also it shows you that they're really trying to interact with that material. So after that, there is a series of questions that go along. And again, I take this for a grade. Thank you so much for watching. If you're like these reading strategy bundles, there are so many more of them that focus on grammar, writing, and reading. If you like the Broadway musical Mania, there's a whole product full of Broadway musical numbers not seen in this product. If you really love the reading strategies and want to use this five day all year long, this is the whole bundle, 50% off. I also have book clubs and book club bundles that you can apply all of these reading strategies with in your classroom.
That's it for me. Thank you so much for joining me and have a wonderful, awesome day. Thank you for teaching the next generation of readers. Adios.